Okay, then uh, I want again to welcome uh, to all of you and uh, let me thank my co-organizer, Professor Vermin Chung, for the beautiful idea, in my opinion, to provide to young researchers a training in the foundations of commutative algebra and algebraic geometry in prime characteristic. And we can say that we start in the best way. It is a pleasure, an honor for me, to introduce uh, Professor Craig Unicke of the, in the University of Virginia. Craig uh, Unicke and Melvin Oxter developed first the theory of the tight closure. In uh, 1988, they published uh, one of the first papers on the subject in the new series of Bulletin of my American Mathematical Society. And uh, let me recall that in the true introduction, they wrote, we define the tight closure of an ideal in characteristic P and use it to give new, much simpler proofs of many theorems in a great strength form. This is the beginning of a fundamental part of international mathematics. Then we can start the first lecture by uh, Professor Craig Unicke, and the title of the talk is where does the tight closure come from? Please, Craig. Thank, thank you very much, Marlena. This is a, can, uh, first of all, I should ask, can everyone hear me all right? It's, it's good. Yes. I'm gonna yes. share my screen and hope it works. Can everyone see that? Okay, well, I will start. So, yes. Uh, everyone can read that, all right? Okay. Um, I can't see the chat while I do this, so I want to encourage anyone uh, that has questions to ask them at any time. And if somebody could check the chat for me and relay them, thanks, Kyle. That would be great. Um, I also want to thank um, ITCP for hosting this event. Um, I love uh, going there, the times I've been there. I hope everyone has a chance to participate in another program in person there sometime. Uh, the organizing committee has been fantastic. Um, and I want to thank them. Also, it's a huge amount of work to, to uh, organize something like this. The list of tutors who are going to be giving the lectures is incredible. Um, many, uh, actually all of them have uh, contributed greatly to this theory in one way or another over the years. And uh, finally, I want to uh, hope the participants uh, have a really good time and uh, have as much fun learning this as I did uh, helping to start it. So with that, let me let me go ahead and start. I don't have a, a lot prepared. I have a few remarks. I also wanted to um, leave time for questions about not so much the actual details of the theory, but maybe questions about to expand on where it came from or how we uh, originally did it. So I'm going to give three answers to start with. I guess I should say, uh, in terms of the years, literally, the um, the start was a talk I gave uh, in the University of Illinois in 1986 at a conference there, I believe in November. And I spoke on something involving the integral closure of ideals, which I'll actually talk about in a little bit. And after the talk, Mel Hoxter came up to me. We'd been talking about various things over the years. And he said, uh, basically he said, uh, what's in answer three down there. He said, maybe we should think about the uh, a crucial idea in the proof. 
and try to conceptualize it. So that sounded great. And we arranged that I would visit the University of Michigan in, as soon as possible in the next year, which was sometime, I think, in February of 1987. And we spent a very intense week uh, working this out. And that was the most magical week of my own mathematical career. It was, it literally was almost like magic. We had this idea and we started thinking about how to apply it. And suddenly all these results just sort of came for free almost. And we were very excited at that time. And since that time, of course, it's been developed by uh, a huge number of people in many different directions, which you'll be hearing about. But let me, let me go to my first answer here, which you probably have already read. Where did it come from? Well, through the late, um, well, through the decade of the 70s, basically, um, characteristic P methods started coming into community of algebra. They already existed in number theory for a long time. For instance, the proof of irreducibility of cyclotomic polynomials and things like that, that those are characteristic P proofs. Um, but really in community of algebra, the fundamental paper of Peskin and Spiro, which proved some of the homological conjectures uh, by reducing them to characteristic P was a crucial step. Uh, Hoxter and Joel Roberts proof that rings of invariance are Cohen Macaulay, which you'll hear about in these lectures. Uh, Kiichi Watanabe, Goto, and others um, uh, started taking up the idea of F purity, which you'll also hear about. Paul Roberts used characteristic P methods to also study homological methods. And then uh, Littmann and Reese are very important in terms of uh, their work on integral closures, even though they didn't directly use characteristic P methods. So that's my first answer. It came from a long history of of uh, characteristic P methods and problems to which you could apply. Another answer was uh, really um, the work of Hoxter to some extent, although Kichi Watanabe and others were also very important here. Um, and that was the desire to find algebraic proofs of results which were purely algebraic, but at that time had only been proved by analytic methods, or in some cases, algebra geometric methods. Uh, Hoxter gave a very important uh, series of talks at George Mason University, where Neil Epstein is right now, um, in 19, um, 19, I forgot the year, 1980, maybe? Uh, where he talked about uh, analytic methods proving uh, algebraic results. And he threw down the gauntlet to, to try to find algebraic uh, proofs of these. And finally, the third answer is one I learned from Mel Hoxter also, and I already mentioned it. Whenever you have a germ of an idea that, that proves something, a method, a lemma, whatever it is, conceptualize it. And what that means is uh, make a definition if you must, but uh, take that nugget of an idea and make a concept of it and start studying that concept. And it's amazing how far that will go sometimes. So um, let me start not with tight closure, but with closure operations in general because tight closure is a closure operation. So here's a question for all the students. Uh, my rings are gonna be Netherian. It's not always necessary, but I, it's much better to stay in that case. I is gonna be an ideal inside R. I hope you can read this. Here's a question. So define a new ideal, which contains I, by the following property. You say an element is in J, this bigger ideal, if and only if for every homomorphism from R to a field, the image of X is always in the image of I in that field. Now, of course, 
it may not look like you're saying much because uh, you know fields have no proper ideas. So the image is either going to be zero or the whole field. So what is J? Well, I'll give you a second to think about it, um, especially the students. Um, anybody have a guess they want to give in the chat? Students only. Anybody brave enough? Leibov suggests the radical of I. Exactly. Very good. The nil radical of I. So J is actually the nil radical of I, which is the set of all X in R, such that there exists an N with X to the N as N. In fact, let me give a theorem here, which says the following are equivalent. Um, first of all, the first property is what I just said, that for all maps to fields, the image of X is in I extended to F. The second is that X is in the intersection of all prime ideals, which contain I. The third is that X is in all the minimal primes containing I, and there are only finitely many of those because it's a um, Ethereum ring. And the last is the property that usually defines the nil radical. And um, it's not hard to prove one implies two implies three. Uh, three implies four is a, in a T.M. McDonald or a common um, um, technique involving localization. And four implies one is more or less trivial. Uh, do it for an exercise if you want. But the thing I want to emphasize here uh, is that um, this property right here, uh, the fourth property is, is an equational one. And it's very useful, as you all know. But the first one has to do with maps to arbitrary fields. It's, they're very different. And it's by combining uh, both of these that you often find a huge amount of strength in applications. All right, let's do another closure operation. Second question. This one. I don't think the students would necessarily know because they may have never seen it before. So the same setup, I have a ring R, an Ethereum, I have an ideal, and I wanted to define a, another ideal. Um, look, and I wanted to define it by the property that for every homomorphism from R into a one-dimensional regular local ring, or also known as a discrete valuation, the rank one discrete valuation ring. Uh, the same property I talked about earlier holds that the image of X, which is phi of X, is in the extension of I to V. Uh, by the way, I, maybe I should say it just for commonality. Um, a field, of course, right here, this is just a zero dimensional regular local ring. Funny way of putting it, but uh, that's all the no radical is. And now I'm just sort of popping the dimension up by one and saying, well, what if you do the same thing, but you only look for maps to discrete valuation rings? Well, this is called the integral closure of R. of I rather, not R. And it's usually denoted uh, with a bar over it. And I believe this um, understanding the integral closure was at least for me, a, a very important part of the development of tight closure. Now, let me give you uh, the theorem about integral closures, which parallels the theorem I gave earlier about the nil radical. So for simplicity, I want to assume um, right here, maybe I should mark this in red, right here, 
uh, that I is not in the union of the minimal primes of R. So for instance, if R is reduced or a domain, I just, or say R is a domain, I'd just be saying I is non-zero. And uh, I have an element X in R, then uh, this means the following R equivalent. So first it has the property I just talked about right here, that for every map to a DVR, I should have said that's a DVR. Yep. This is a DVR. So one dimensional regular local view. The image is in I of V. A second one is a very useful one if you know more about the integral closure of rings, which is what typically you study first. If S is the integral closure of the Reese ring, RIT, so this is the subring of the polynomial ring, uh, which is generated by the elements little i times t. And if we just take the integral closure, then um, inside RT, then the property one is equivalent to saying that x times t is an s. Third one is an equational. So this is the equational characterization. And it says that uh, something very much like the nil radical, it says there's a monic polynomial satisfied by x such that the coefficients get into higher and higher powers of i. a1 is in i, a2 is in i squared, et cetera. a sub n is in uh, i to the n. So, this obviously, by the way, implies that um, X is in the nil radical since everything here is in I already. So this certainly says X to the N is in I. And the fourth is maybe the most important for tight closure. It says that you don't actually have to check one equation. You don't have to check maps to rings, but you can check um, sort of uh, infinitely many equations in some sense, that there exists a C which is not in the minimal primes of R, the union, such that uh, C X to the N is I to the N, and I should have quantified N here. So this is for all N sufficiently large. So all these are equivalent characterizations of the integral closure of the idea. I see a chat here. I can see the chat. I didn't realize I could. Oh yeah, good. Yes, they're in the George Mason. That was that George Mason conference was, I believe, the very first time I met uh, Kiichi Watanabe, which has played a huge role in all this. It was a real pleasure to meet him. At that, I believe you can correct me if I'm wrong, Kiichi. So I'm just gonna repeat um, what I've already said. Um, the set of all X satisfying these equivalent conditions, it's called the integral closure. And it's an ideal containing uh, I and contained in the nil radical of I. And it's extremely important uh, ideal for many reasons, but there are two directly related to tight closure. And I want to mention one of them and give you a small proof about the other one. So um, I think I said right at the start that uh, several things had been proved using analytic methods that there was no known algebraic proof for. And this is what Hoxter based many of his lectures on. And one of them was something called the Briance and Skoda theorem. So I'm gonna give you the Briance and Skoda theorem, a statement of it. I hope you can see that. Um, you have R in this case is a power series ring and in variables and an arbitrary ideal. Then the Briance and Skoda theorem says that the integral closure of the nth power of I is contained in I. Uh, the N here, notice these Ns actually match up. So this N, and this end are the same end. That was very critical. 
Uh, this was inspired um, by a question of Mather actually originally. Uh, what do I have on the next slide? Oh, good. Uh, maybe I should mention that now. Mather's question was based on uh, the following. So R here is a, uh, R is again a power series ring over the complex numbers and F is in R. Then it was known that uh, F is always integral over its partials. Uh, this is to me, one of the fundamental uh, relations about integral closure, which I was always fascinated with. And uh, Mather asked, now remember the integral closure is always inside the nil radical of the same idea. So there exists some n such that f to the n is in the partials. This is not obvious. If you try to prove it directly sometimes you will find how hard it is. Uh, and Mather's question was that, uh, well, I think his original question is, can n be chosen independent of f? And the branson Skoda theorem gives this answer and I'll say why. It's because, um, so let me go back up to what it says. It says that the nth power of any, the integral closure of the nth power of any ideal is in the ideal. And all I really need to do is note here that if you take the integral closure and raise it to the nth power, it's always inside uh, this in general. This is very easy to prove using the equivalent characterizations I gave. So if you go down here, if you combine this statement with the theorem of Briens and Skoda, you see that in fact, F to the N is always here. So the Brianson Skoda theorem answered in the affirmative the question of Mather, and it did so by giving actually a, a it actually told you what the uniform number was. Yeah. By the way, uh, while I mention it uh, on this, you might ask what it means if n is one, and there's a very famous theorem of Saito which says that if if f equals zero is an isolated singularity, then uh, n is one if and only if uh, f is so-called quasi-homogeneous, that there's some weighting that can make it homogeneous. So uh, this was the focus of one of the focuses of Hoxter's lectures at the George Mason meeting. And Lippmann and Sate gave an algebraic proof soon after that. But I was a colleague of Lippmann at that time and I was working hard on the integral closures of ideals. David Reese visited Purdue at that time. And um, I started thinking about um, more about powers and integral closures of ideals. And I wanna show you an argument at that time that was, um, I wrote up in a paper in I think 86, and it was what I was talking on at this Illinois conference because uh, this shows you a tight closure argument without ever mentioning tight closure. So I wanna end with this basically, because to some extent, this was the beginning for me of, of this journey. So let uh, X1 through XD be a regular sequence.
By the way, I guess I should have said there is a very easy tight closure proof of Briant's discovery, which you'll probably see in the lectures. I'm not going to give it now, of course. So um, remember for the students here, uh, if you've just started studying some of this, this means um, that x1 is a non zero divisor. And xi is a non zero divisor uh, on r mod the first i minus one of it. Um, and the yoga is that regular sequences, I'll use this a little bit behave as if they are variables as much as they can, at least when they interact with themselves. Uh, you can make this precise using uh, the Cohen structure theorem and flatness, but I don't think I wanna do that in this talk right now. Um, so here's a theorem. It may not look like much, but it actually has a lot of consequences. And this was, I should give credit, this was done by Ito in all cases and by myself if it contains a field. And I'm basically, there's a more general statement, but I'm gonna prove the simplest case of this right now because I wanna show you how uh, characteristic P can come in to help you. So the theorem is very simple. Uh, let, always an Ethereum ring. Suppose you have a regular sequence. And I is the integral closure of the ideal they generate. If you want a specific example, you can think of the case where F is a hypersurface with an isolated singularity. The partials would be a regular sequence in this case. And uh, we just saw that F is uh, always in the integral closure, for instance. So that would be an example of such a phenomenon. Then if you look at this intersect I squared, even I squared bar, maybe I should put bar here. It's just the X's times the ideal I. Um, so what does this mean, i.e.? So that's the statement. If the summation of Ri Xi is in the integral closure, then the Ri's can be chosen in the integral closure. Now, in fact, because all the syzygies on a regular sequence are, are uh, generated by the Kazool syzygies, you can see that in fact, all choices of Ri will have to be in I bar, but literally it doesn't say that to start. And I wanna stress something in my own thinking about tight closure, that one of the things in commutative algebra that I've always um, been very curious about is when you have some relation like this, I mean, it could be a summation Ri Xi is in some other idea. What can you say about the coefficients? These are the hardest things to pick out. Uh, you have some general relation, but how can you more easily determine the coefficients? And this is where I think analytic methods were incredibly powerful. 
in problems like this. And what tight closure has done to some extent is allow us to uh, replace analytic methods by these characteristic P methods in, in almost all cases. Uh, Craig, so, there's a, a question real quick in the chat. Um, so in your expression there, um, are the RS is supposed to be, or the RI is supposed to be in I itself or in I bar? Are the RIs, oh, um, sorry, thank you. I bar is I because um, yeah. Yeah. this is I. Yes, thank you. But what I really meant to write is, uh, is this, right? But uh, when you take the integral closure of an ideal, if you do it twice, you, nothing new is added. And, uh, thank you. Thanks. So let's prove this. Give a sketch. So proof. So we have this sum. I'm just going to do it with I squared. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, let me go back to the, I'm going to have to go backwards. I know in Zoom, that's a real pain uh, to see these screens flashing by, but I'm going to go backwards for a second or two here anyway. I want to use this fourth property of, of uh, integral closures, that there's a C uh, not in any minimal prime above in R such that Cx to the n is in I to the n, if, it, if x is integral. So that has the, uh, the following consequence, there exists a C not in the union of the minimal primes of R, such that. Um, C times I squared bar to the N is in I to the two. Uh, you can do it at an element in time, but because uh, the ring is in the theory, and there'll be a finite set of generators. You can do it for each one and take the product of the C's that work for each one, and that will do this. So I want to now assume we're in characteristic P. This is prime characteristic. And I want to take uh, the element Y just this element. And I want to use that C y to the n is in i to the two n. Actually, sorry, um, I did i the same mistake again. Um, sorry, I better just erase. It is, the statement was correct, but I want to use the stronger statement that it's in this ideal. And that's simply because I squared is integral over X1 through XD squared. And I want to do the same thing here. And uh, I want to use this with n equals p to the e. Well, uh, the nice thing working in characteristic p, as I'm sure all of you already know, is that when you, it's an endomorphism, the so-called Frobenius. So uh, it has this property simply because all the binomial coefficients, uh, if you raise it to the pth power, all the binomial coefficients are zero characters when they operate on the ring. So when we do this uh, to y, we get the following.
But now, uh, if we apply this box property here, we get the fun. We get the much nicer expression. like this. And now what have we achieved by this? So what we've achieved is we've now got an equation um, that just involves essentially the x's. The integral closure has disappeared. Excuse and me, that, Greg, they are asking if you can kindly show the previous page one more. I didn't know. It's OK. Thanks. Yeah. It's all right? Yeah, thanks. You probably want to specify that this is for all n. Here. Yeah. That would help. Thanks. Actually, just large n is enough, but in fact, you can do it like this. Thank you. Um, so, um, I want to make a side comment about these coefficients and why characteristic P is so useful, which is a more of a heuristic philosophical. The, you see, if, if you're in characteristic zero and you take an expression like this and you expand it out, of course, there's all these terms, multinomials in the X's with mixed, you know, mixed terms with the RIs. And it's extremely hard to usefully analyze that. Maybe there's a new method out there at some point that we'll discover that allows you to do it. But at this time, at least I don't know how to do it truly usefully. And that's where things like harmonic analysis and stuff really helped I, in, in my own estimation. But what characteristic P does is it removes all the static, all the noise. And allows you just to look at the p to the eighth powers themselves. And this is really incredibly useful. So finally, we need a little exercise now to finish off, which I'll, so the exercise, whoa, what did I just do? I don't know what I just did, but I didn't want to do that. I'll write it in red. So the exercise, is to prove if, uh, if x1 through xd is a regular sequence. And you have a sum that looks like this. For any n then the SI are in the nth power for all of them. So I know you're doing a lot of exercises here. Uh, if they were variables, this would be quite easy. Uh, they always behave like variables. So you can do this any number of ways, but um, try it and see, see how you do it. So I wanna apply this exercise up here now back to the proof. And uh, the conclusion from this exercise in this equation is that hence, for all p to the e, c r i to the p to the e is in x1 through x d to the p to the e. And if you recall the criterion for integral closure that uh, it was number four on my list that I used in this. This exactly implies that Ri is actually in the integral closure. This is for all I. And that's the end of the proof. Now, there's no tight closure here, um, but um, this was the argument um, that in some sense, um, it, it's not the only argument. 
there were arguments like this done by Hoxter in his amiable system of parameters paper, where he talks about big Cohen Macaulay algebras. Uh, there are arguments somewhat like this in the Hoxter Roberts paper about rings of invariance of Cohen Macaulay. But uh, uh, this was maybe the first time it had been so explicitly used with, uh, with this uh, particular type of multiplier here. So I guess I should give you the definition of tight closure before, but I mean, you'll see it in a second anyway. And then I wanna share a screen uh, showing you some of our first thoughts on tight closure. So uh, the characteristic of R is P. By the way, I should have said here too, this is a characteristic P proof, but by reduction to characteristic P, which I uh, hope you'll learn a little bit about in this, these lectures, uh, this immediately proves the same theorem as long as the ring contains a field. But I do want to point out Ito did it by other methods uh, without any restriction at all. Um, Craig, uh, Professor Swanson pointed out in the chat that um, upstairs when you were working with the uh, integral closure um, criteria, it should have been infinitely many in or equivalence with all infinite many in. Yes. Did I not write for all large in or something like that? I think you wrote for all in. Uh, okay. Yeah, for, okay. I won't go back to correct it right now, but yes, that's absolutely right, of course. Uh, so characteristic P, we say an I, an ideal generated by a bunch of elements. We say X is in the tight closure of I. Um, if and only if there exists a C, not in the union of the minimal primes of R, such that for all E sufficiently large, C, X, P to the E. Now, if I just wrote I to the P to the E, that would be integral closure. So this is tighter than that. And it, um, it's this. So that's the original definition of tight closure. Um, one of the most important aspects of tight closure, which I think you learn about in the second series of lectures is that the C's here can actually be chosen independent of X and I. This is uh, enormously important called, we called such things test elements. So I want to stop this share now and share one other screen, but let me, before I uh, yeah, sorry, stop this share, there may be some more questions. Yeah, there's one more question here um, in the chat. After proving the result in characteristic P, how do you conclude it in characteristic zero? So that's a whole process. Um, basically, you, um, you localize first. So this is a general process. If you wanna, if you have some equation you've shown or has to happen and you wanna show it um, in characteristic P. So you start in characteristic zero now containing the field. And you first get a local. If you're not local already, you localize to make it local. Then you complete. And then you have to use uh, a, uh, very big theorem called the Artin approximation theorem. You, you assume you have a counterexample basically, and you're gonna carry that counterexample from characteristic zero to characteristic P. So counterexample, given a counterexample. Use Artin approximation to get a counterexample in a uh, finitely generated algebra over a field, over the some base field. Uh, 
Then you use uh, something called generic flatness. Sorry. Yes. We get a lot of spam calls, I'm afraid. I don't know. It'll stop in a second. Um, use generic flatness and collect coefficients. To get a counterexample. In a finitely generated algebra. Over um, a finitely generated Z algebra, where the coefficients are, uh, which is inside F. And finally, you go mod maximal ideals. Let me call this A of A to get a counterexample. And characteristic P. So it's a very complicated process, but it was worked out by Hoxter. So Peskin and Spiro did uh, a similar thing uh, starting here in their paper using characteristic P methods. And Hoxter realized you could use art and approximation to, to do things in general and outline this in uh, his previous work. So this whole uh, machine, as it were, had already been set up where you can almost automatically conclude in characteristic zero, equal characteristic zero theorems you've proved in characteristic P. I don't know if this actually will be covered in these courses or not, uh, but it's sort of a black box if you, you can take it that way. Um, any other questions before I stop? Mm -hmm. Craig, there is another question. If this process for this machine is often called reduction to characteristic P? Yes, exactly. That's correct. So when somebody says reduction to characteristic P, they mean essentially you, you've gone through this, this whole process I just outlined. Anything else? Thank you. Can I stop this share? Okay, I just want to show you, I've been going through my old notebooks. I, by the way, I, I've always kept notebooks with my, um, just my calculations or work or, I mean, most of it's junk, truthfully. But I would highly recommend you do this yourself for you know, anybody starting out. Um, you will be glad you did. Um, and uh, often you think to yourself as you get older, oh, I think I did something about that. 20 years ago and you can't remember? Well, I can find it in my notebooks. So I've been going through these and uh, putting them in PDFs actually. And luckily I was doing one just before this. And I wanna show you what I found. This was in the first notebook in tight closure where I started working on it with Mel. So can you see this? So this was a list of problems and questions we had almost after that first week of magical week. So to start with, we called it sharp closed action. So the sharp you see there is really became tight closure. Um, so you can see the first thing we noticed is that if every ideal is tightly closed, we could prove Cohen-Macaulay. Um, we wanted to give a definition in characteristic zero, which we eventually did. We wanted to understand what class of rings had the property that every ideal was tightly closed. That's one of the F singularities you'll learn about. We wanted to give a criterion for quasi-homogeneous hypersurfaces for when they had this property. We knew it had a relationship to rational singularities, but at that time we didn't know what it was. Uh, property five is to give a good name. It didn't really have a name for a while. And we eventually chose tight because it, uh, uh, as you'll see, it's, it's a very tight fit to your original idea. 
we needed to know about what happened when you completed or if you localized. Of course, localization became a big open problem for a long time until the counterexample by Brenner and Monsky, and there's still open questions about that. Uh, well, we wanted to sharpen results in our original notes. So uh, we wanted to apply it to direct summons of regular rings. You'll hear about that in some of these. Uh, we wanted to know what it meant in low dimension. We wanted to give criteria, other criteria for what it meant to be in the tight closure, and what it means. Um, and then at the very bottom, you'll see that uh, some notes about every ideal in a regular ring, colons are in the sharp closure. Uh, these are all things you'll, you'll be seeing about in this. But um, I think right away we knew pretty well that this was going to be related to all these things. And working this out has taken uh, a lot of people over a lot of years to do. Uh, many, many people have made substantial contributions to this, as you'll hear about. So that's really all I wanted to say. Uh, it's been uh, a great fun for me working on this, and I hope you all enjoy it. Maybe not as much, but at least somewhat. <laughs>